Sewage is always better when it's out of sight and out of mind. And the only reason it stays that way is wastewater infrastructure. We're in the middle of construction for a new sewage lift station just outside San Antonio, Texas. I'm filming the entire process and sharing it with you because it's not always easy to understand how projects like this come together. And I want everyone to appreciate how much hard work goes into the infrastructure they might not even know they rely on every day. In the last episode, we saw the underground piping go in, the manholes installed, and an overview of how this pumping station will work together with its neighbor to deliver raw wastewater uphill to a nearby treatment plant. When we left off, this monster plug valve had just arrived on site. Let me show you how to install a valve so big you could fit your head in it, and lots more. I'm your host, Grady Hillhouse, and this is Practical Construction. The San Antonio River Authority's existing lift station is in service at this site, working 24-7 to keep the wastewater moving. The construction of this new lift station will make it easier to take the existing one offline for maintenance. But first, it will need this enormous valve to redirect wastewater flows from the existing wet well to the new one. And it needs to be installed below a concrete slab. A crew uses a diamond saw to cut out the concrete above where the line will be excavated. Then an excavator begins work to remove the soil above the line. Like all the trenches on this job, this one will need shoring to keep the soil from collapsing while crews are working inside. Eventually, the crew gets the line uncovered, but it can't be cut just yet. Remember that all the wastewater from the surrounding area has been collected and concentrated into a single pipe. This one. Before the valve is installed, all that sewage will need to be temporarily redirected. This bypass pump is just the right piece of equipment for the job. The crew lays out the hoses for the pump between an upstream manhole and the downstream lift station. Then they build a ramp so vehicles can get over the top. An inflatable plug will keep wastewater from flowing into the 24 inch or 600 millimeter diameter sewer line while the valve gets installed. The pump will divert the wastewater straight into the lift station, bypassing the sewer line. A worker monitors the level of sewage in the manhole and regulates the bypass pumping to keep up with the wastewater flow. Meanwhile, a crew works to cut the existing line. Once a section of pipe has been removed, the valve can be lowered into place. This valve uses a mechanical joint to connect to the existing plastic pipe. Bolts connect a gland to the valve and compress a gasket between the two, pressing it tightly against the pipe to make a watertight seal. The crew finishes installing the valve with haste, and then they use gravel bedding to backfill the trench just like the rest of the underground piping on the project. At the new lift station across the site, it's time for more backfill. It might be hard to tell, but all of this work is still happening under what will be the final grade. Now that all the pipes are installed, the site needs to be brought up to its designed elevation. Anywhere that will eventually get concrete is backfilled with this select material. It's basically road base, crushed rock that interlocks and compacts into an extremely stable subgrade. The other parts of the site that won't be used to support any structures can be backfilled with the native clay. First, the materials spread out in an even layer called a lift. Then the roller compacts it into place. 
an inspector checks the density of the backfill as a quality control measure. A hole is hammered into the new compacted soil using a metal pin. Then the tester pushes a source rod into the hole. This rod has a radioactive source on the tip and actually requires a license to operate one of these gauges, but backfill is important. A lot of expensive stuff is gonna sit on this material and we don't want it settling over time. The nuclear gauge can calculate the density and water content of the soil based on how much of the source radioactivity makes it through to the sensor above the surface. Most of the underground work is done by now, but not all of it. This lift station will use some pretty big pumps, which means it needs robust electrical connections. The conductors between the pumps will run in underground conduits. First, the trenches are shored. Then the bed and gravel goes in to provide even support to the conduits once they're buried. With the conduits installed, a layer of red concrete goes in. The red color is an extra precaution to warn anyone digging in the future that there are electrified lines below. Finally, the trenches are backfilled with select fill and compacted to prepare for construction of the control shelter. They use a vibratory plate compactor around the larger areas and a tamping rammer also known as a jumping jack compactor, to get into the tighter spaces. At this point, there's a lot happening all at once on site, so don't mind if I show a few things out of order to keep the story clear. Construction schedules are rarely designed with narrative structure in mind. This area will eventually get a concrete slab and a steel shelter to protect the lift station's electrical equipment and controls. The shelter will be supported by three posts concreted into these holes in the ground. The crew works to install the concrete forms that will make up the post's foundations and compact the surrounding soil to create a firm base. Each form tube is checked for level and elevation before it's secured into place with backfill. Each hole will also get steel reinforcement before the concrete is placed. This rebar helps the concrete foundation resist forces like wind loads that the shelter will be subject to. Once the posts have been installed and concreted into place, the crew works on forming the rest of the shelter pad. They install formwork around the edges, tie reinforcing steel to be embedded in the slab, and form around locations where electrical conduit comes up from underground. And before long, it's time for the concrete trucks. Concrete is placed into the forms using the chute on the truck. It's spread roughly into place with shovels. Then a screed board sets the top surface. Once all the concrete is in, a magnesium float is used to smooth the surface and embed the large aggregate in the concrete. The bull float has a tilting mechanism that makes it easy to smooth the concrete in both directions, pushing and pulling. Then the slab is left to cure. It's a little hard to see with the concrete in, but the entire perimeter of formwork is lined with these little wooden triangles called chamfer strips. When the formwork is removed from the slab, you can see the nice 45 degree corners or chamfers these strips create. The chamfers not only improve the appearance of the slabs, but they reduce the chances of the corners chipping or breaking over time, extending the lifespan of the pad. Once the slab's complete, the rest of the shelter can be installed. Steel sheets are attached all along the roof and the back wall. These sheets will eventually protect the electrical equipment panels from sun and weather. We'll come back to the shelter when the electricians have made some progress on those panels. Right now, there's more concrete to place. The area between the wet well and the new shelter will eventually have all the discharge piping from the pumps and other equipment above ground. But first, it needs a concrete slab. The crew finishes compacting the subgrade below the slab and checks the level using a laser. 
Just like the electrical shelter, this equipment slab starts with formwork around the perimeter and a mat of reinforcing steel. The concrete arrives on site. However, before it goes into the forms, a little bit goes into a wagon for the testing lab. How do we know that the concrete delivered to a construction site actually meets the specifications required by the engineer? We have to do quality control tests, or at least a technician on site does. First, the technician performs a test to check the workability or consistency of the mix called a slump test. A cone is filled with the concrete and rotted to remove air bubbles. Then the cone is lifted, allowing the concrete to slump. The distance from the top of the cone to the top of the concrete is measured, and this must be within the allowable guidelines. Too little slump and the concrete won't flow easily into the forms. Too much slump may be a sign that the concrete has been improperly mixed. This test also helps verify that the concrete across multiple trucks has similar properties. Next, the technician checks the air content of the concrete. The air meter applies pressure to the concrete sample, compressing the bubbles within the mix so that the change in volume can be measured. Not enough air entrained in the concrete can make it brittle and subject to flaking, especially under freezing conditions. Too much air can make the concrete difficult to finish and create surface defects. Finally, the technician uses plastic molds to form concrete cylinders. These cylinders will eventually undergo compression testing after they've had time to cure to make sure that the concrete is as strong as required by the engineer. If the concrete company made an error in a batch they sent to the site, it would be caught by one of these tests and the slab would have to be taken out and redone. Luckily, all the concrete on this project passed quality control with flying colors. This equipment slab is placed just like the one at the electrical shelter. Just before the concrete is too stiff, a broom is run along the surface to provide a non-slip texture to the slab. That's another one done on this project, but we're still far from finished with concrete. The next task is the light pole. Like the shelter, this pole will be supported using a drilled concrete shaft. And the drill just arrived in a pickup truck. Skid steers are versatile little machines and this one has been equipped with a miniature drill rig. The surveyor has already marked the center point of the hole and now it's time to drill out the soil so the concrete can be installed. The process is simple. Spin the auger until the soil is broken up in the hole Pull it out and shake it off. Then do it again. And again. It doesn't take long at all to reach the final depth of the hole, almost as deep as this little auger can reach. Then a trench is dug to run the power lines through conduit to the light. Reinforcing steel is placed inside the hole, and a cardboard tube is used to form the pier above the ground. This will get concrete in a moment. Meanwhile, workers are making progress forming the slab over the top of the wet well. First, scaffolding will have to be assembled within the wet well. Something has to support the underside of the concrete slab while it's cast in place, so scaffolding is erected inside the wet well to provide the support. All this scaffolding will have to be removed through the access hatch once the concrete is cured, so all this has to be easy to disassemble when the time comes. Finally, the carpenters install a plywood false cover over the top of the wet well that will form the bottom of the concrete slab. Unlike the equipment slab, that is essentially a continuous area of concrete, the wet well cover slab has a lot of embedded items. In addition to the formwork, it gets blockouts for the vent pipe, the stilling well, each of the three discharge lines for the pumps, a suction line for the backup diesel pump, and vent line for the air release valve. 
Don't worry if all this equipment means nothing to you right now. I'll show you what all of it does when it's installed. Of course, the biggest blockout is the access hatch that will allow people and equipment to get into and out of the wet well once the project's finished. The access hatch is placed where it will be embedded in the concrete slab. Then it's secured into place so that it doesn't shift during the concrete pour. One challenge with the concrete slab above the wet well is that it needs to stay attached to that structure no matter what. If the heavy concrete wet well settles over time, we don't want the slab on top being separated from the rest of the structure. The project's structural engineer developed a pretty cool way to make sure these two components of the project act as one. And it involves a lot of cardboard. These are void forms designed to fit perfectly within the space of the wet well cover slab. Well, perfectly with a bit of excavation. This shot is a perfect reminder of how strong the select backfill can be. That angular crushed rock compacts so tightly you need a hammer drill to break it loose. The void forms were manufactured and delivered to the site already built, so it's kind of like a puzzle getting them all to fit just right. These cardboard forms are strong enough to hold up the concrete while it cures, but they will quickly deteriorate, leaving an empty space below the slab. The concrete is designed to only be supported by the perimeter of the wet well itself. That ensures that if the wet well settles over time, the slab will settle too, without experiencing undue stress from the underlying subgrade pushing back upward. If you had a careful eye, you may have caught these retaining blocks being cast on site earlier in this episode using some simple carpentry for molds. We called them pavers since they look like stepping stones you might buy at the hardware store. Once they're cured, the retaining blocks get placed all around the formwork for the wet well cover slab. After the cardboard void forms deteriorate, they leave an empty space between the concrete slab and the subgrade, which is an issue around the edges. We don't want soil collapsing into the void that's left behind, or any animals getting in there either. So the project requires these precast concrete retainers be installed all around the perimeter of the wet well slab. When the cardboard dissolves, these will keep soil from filling the void while still allowing the slab some freedom to move up or down with the wet well. The reinforcing steel is installed inside the forms. That gets an inspection to make sure it conforms to the engineered plans. And finally, it's time to place the concrete. All that reinforcing steel is needed to make sure this slab can cantilever out past the wet well since it won't be supported from underneath once the cardboard dissolves. And all the blockouts, electrical conduits, and the access hatch are secured in place. The concrete is spread into place with rakes, and it's vibrated to help it consolidate and flow around the dense mesh of rebar. You can see the air bubbles coming up out of the concrete as it's vibrated into place. The finishing crew carefully floats the surface all around the penetrations. The foundation for the light pole gets concrete in the drilled hole, and then it gets more concrete in the trench carrying the electrical conduit that will deliver power to the light. This is a perfect example of the pace of heavy construction. It's taken days and weeks of hard work to get this light pole and wet well cover slab formed and ready for concrete, and then the trucks and finishing crews arrive and are done with the pour before lunchtime. A few more structures need to be installed before the concrete on this job is mostly over. One is the slab that will hold a diesel pump that can be turned on in the event of an emergency or power outage when the main pumps are out of service. The subgrade below the slab gets backfilled and compacted. Electrical conduits are installed that will carry the control cables then the concrete can go in. The wet well also gets an electrical rack to hold all the connections between the panels, sensors, and pumps. There will also be an outlet here for any equipment needed to service the wet well when it's complete. The conduits stub up from their underground trenches and the wet well cover slab here. 
the carpenters assemble the formwork, and the fresh concrete is placed inside. Once the concrete is cured, the forms are stripped off these slabs and they get compacted backfill around the sides. Before long, the electricians have the rack and junction boxes installed at the wet well. And while they're backfilling, the crews finish installing those concrete retainers. You can really see how soil might collapse into the void forms below the wet well lid without them. Another concrete placement is for a curb that surrounds the diesel pump slab. If the pump ever leaks fuel, this curb will keep the diesel from contaminating the adjacent soil. A pipe with a valve makes it possible to drain the containment area of rainwater. The last place we need some concrete, for now, is at the new manholes. The cast iron covers have already been installed on the concrete manholes, and now they need concrete around the rim and valve box covers. This area is backfilled with select material, compacted and formed. Then the concrete is placed as required in the plans. Remember that these manholes aren't doing anything yet. The active sewer lines are still running straight through them with no connection. One thing that's needed before those lines can be cut is on its way, but they need to be cleaned out first. A crew power washes the inside of both manholes and the wet well in preparation for what's next. That's the job of this box truck pulling into the site. If sewage decomposes without a good supply of fresh air, it can generate hydrogen sulfide gas. This gas is not only poisonous, but also extremely corrosive to steel and concrete. To protect these new structures from the challenging environment in a wastewater system, the walls and floor of the manholes and lift station wet well will get a spray-on epoxy liner. The worker dons a protective suit and respirator before descending into each manhole to apply the coating. The gun mixes the two-part epoxy right before it exits the nozzle. Touch-ups are applied topside. Next, another worker uses a trowel to smooth the lining and ensure consistent coverage. It only takes a few hours for the epoxy to fully cure and harden. The parts of the wet well that won't be lined are masked off first. Then the spray lining is applied to the inside walls. The worker checks the thickness of the wet epoxy to make sure he's applying the right amount. The manholes in wet well are now considered confined spaces, so there are special safety precautions about working inside them. The crew uses a gas meter to check for a hazardous atmosphere. They use ventilation fans to keep fresh air flowing. They have a rescue winch installed to lift the worker out of the hole if anything were to happen. And they have a spotter whose only job is to keep an eye on the worker inside to make sure they're staying safe. Before long, the entire wet well walls are lined with the protective coating. The masking is removed from the access hatch, and this team will be back once the bottom of the wet well is finished to complete the job. The concrete slabs are almost all complete. The manholes are ready for wastewater, the electrical shelter is ready for equipment, and the wet well is ready for pumps. Seems like a lot is left to be done, but these last steps of the project will happen before you know it. And we'll see the San Antonio River Authority's newest lift station start up for the very first time. That's the next and final episode of this series on practical construction. A few statistics you might find interesting. This project took about 10 months total from start to finish. We were on site a full 70 days throughout construction to capture all the footage you've seen so far, and the last episode took 20 more days of shooting. That episode's live on Nebula right now at the link in the description if you can't wait to see the rest. I had to get a drone license and a drone, new camera gear, including solar-powered time-lapse rigs that sometimes worked and sometimes didn't. We had to upgrade computers and storage to handle all the 4K footage, work with lawyers and insurance to be on a construction site, we got production help for graphics, color correction, editing, and even had music composed for the show. All this to say that producing practical construction has been a huge leap from the normal videos I make on this channel 
building garage demonstrations and talking to the camera in my spare bedroom. This series was meant as a pilot to see if the viewership and interest could justify all the extra cost and effort that went into documenting this project. You can look at the stats on YouTube, the viewership isn't anywhere close to my normal videos, but that doesn't tell the whole story because a big portion of the people watching the series are doing it on Nebula. You know about Nebula by now, the streaming platform built by and for independent creators. You could never get a show like Practical Construction greenlit on a TV network these days unless it was full of drama, fake cliffhangers, and fluff. I don't want to watch that show, and I don't think you do either. So consider subscribing to a streaming platform that actually empowers independent creators like me to make shows like this. Nebula has totally ad-free videos from excellent educational channels, original series and specials that can't be found anywhere else, and even classes from your favorite creators like Sam from Windover Productions. Watching the last episode of Practical Construction a full two weeks early is dead simple. Click the link below and you'll get 40% off an annual plan. That means you pay just one time, $30, for an entire year's access to Nebula. That's less than $3 a month. Help me show the world how cool construction can be without having to turn it into a reality show by clicking that link in the description below. Thank you for watching, and let me know what you think.